as a dog. Well, Alright, what we got to talk about here is we got a little, you know, you're trying to die, we've got diagnostic decisions every time whenever we come to a place where we're trying to find out what's wrong with something, what we got to do, we've got to decide what we need to do instead of just flying in there. You know, he was talking yesterday about some people just, you know, throw in parts here, there, and you know, a lot of times people will change parts because they feel like that's something they know how to do. They're not really there. What they're doing a lot of times is they're changing the part because they hope when they change the part they will have found the problem. The worst thing that can happen to somebody is if they guess their way to a fix about two or three times in a row, then they think they've unlocked the mysteries of the universe and they get in big trouble. Uh, and what we're trying to do here is trying to teach all that. Well, on this 98 F-150, had 201,054 miles on it, 4.6 liter engine, 4 hour 70 W transaxle. Transaxle, right. It was a transmission, right? The engine was skipping, but there was no mill lap. Now, on a 98 model, what can you what can you think of that will cause the engine where the engine would skip, but there wouldn't be a mill lap? Spark plug. Wouldn't the spark plug cause the mill lap to come on? Yeah. It would. Low fuel pressure. Wouldn't that cause the mill lap to come on? Not necessarily. Would that make it skip? Yeah. Low fuel pressure make them skip. I'm saying what is light not come on. You mean a low fuel pressure gonna make it miss on one cylinder? Or? Oh, well, not just on one cylinder. It's gonna not run right, but you couldn't always say it was. But even if you got low fuel pressure, it's gonna get to the rich adaptive limit, and it's gonna turn on a mill lap. Vacuum, huh? Vacuum. Well, Vacuum just pressure. about everything that goes wrong in the way of a skip or running bad or whatever that's emission related is gonna make the mill lap come on. But this one, there was no mill light. So what do you suppose the problem was? What if it was? The bulb blown what in the mill light? The bulb was blown in the mill light. <laughs> well, that's a true question. <laughs> well, not necessarily. He was thinker. Good I was job, trying sir. to. This is all about good critical job. thinking and all that. So a good mechanic has got to apply critical thinking to determine what needs doing. you got to have gumption to get it done in spite of pitfalls and hard parts of it and integrity to get the job done right. Well, that's basically what we're doing here. Now, this engine calibration kit, I'm going to show you this right here. It's pretty cool. And I got this thing in there that uh, there was somebody sent it to me to evaluate because I wrapped it in the magazine. This little thing is cool as all get and it costs about $150, but you find top dead center with it. You screw it into the spark plug hole, and if it's one of those that's going right down on top of the piston, you can turn the engine over, and it will push that up and then whenever it starts to go back down, you can actually find top dead center on any cylinder with that, right? And then you're going to do your cylinder leakage. Now this is basically what we had to do on this one here. Now this slide is a little out of place. I probably should have, you know, put it in a different spot. Uh, but anyway, Rachel was working on it this morning. So what we had when we did our, when we did our check, we actually found out that it was skipping on cylinder number five. The misfire the monitor was telling us it was skipping on cylinder number five. This is the engine that you tore apart out there. <laughs> now, the one that he tore apart, you know, somebody had done something to cause water to get in the cylinders and didn't get it out of there. But it was running when it came in here and it had been driven a lot and it had all those miles on it. And uh, it turned into a wild ride. But the long and the short of it was, so I told him, I said, hey, listen, we're skipping on number five. We got low compression on number five. We had 70 pounds of compression is all they had on number five. All the rest of them were showing good strong compression. So when the two guys that were working on it came in here, I said, what we're going to do now, uh, you know, whenever you spin it over, checking with the compression, by the way, you need six puffs. You know, puff, 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 puff. You know, don't, don't just puff it once. That's going to make it, you know, bump on up where it works full speed. And that one basically puffed up to 70 PSI. Okay, so what is the next thing we do when we found, we're trying to pinpoint it. We don't just say, whoop, low compression, pull the head off. What are we going to do next? We want to try to gather all the data that we can so we can make an equitable decision. You test all cylinders for compression and you... We did that first and we found out we had 70 on 5 and all the rest of them were good. Injector. How about... Well, we're, yeah, that's, well, 70... Uh, yeah, ejector is not going to have anything to do with the compression. You squirt some oil in some. Yes, that's a good plan. You can squirt some oil in there and if the compression comes up, what does that mean? Say so you got bad rings or uh, the cylinder wall would drop. We got, yeah, if it's got dry cylinder walls or bad rings, you know, putting oil in there is going to bring it up. In this particular case, we decided we were going to do a, you know, with this, this thing right here, the cylinder leakage tester, which basically what you do is you plug your air hose into it, you dial the regulator until it's reading 
zero leakage. And then you hook it into a hose that's screwed into the spark plug hole in the cylinder. But you use these tools to find top dead center on that cylinder, put the whistle in there first, and then you spin it over until it goes, you know, it's got enough compression to where it's going to whistle. When it starts to whistle, you stop. And then you screw that out, and you screw that one in, and basically you keep barring the engine with a bar over until this comes up right and you know you're on top dead center and you know that if everything's like it ought to be that both the intake and the exhaust valve will be closed and you should have a sealed chamber that no air will leak out of. So you put a cylinder leakage tester on it and we had lots of cylinder leakage on that cylinder. This is what we had. It's supposed to be way over here in the green somewhere but what we had is Way over here. So what are we going to do now to find out where that air is getting out of there? When you find out how it's getting out of the cylinder, you're kind of knowing which direction you need to go with your repair. So we're still gathering data. All we've done is pull the plugs out, do a compression test. We did a cylinder leakage test on the cylinder that was in question. You can also do a running compression test and you can snap the throttle and read all of those readings and you can find out a heck of a lot from a running compression test, but we didn't do that. In this particular case. You can take the smoke machine, put it in a spark plug hole, and see where the smoke comes We can do that, which is what the next uh, slide was. But what the deal is here, we can also, while we've still got the air going in there, we can take our listed pipe and we can go to the intake, we can go to the exhaust, and we can go to the crankcase, and we can actually look in the radiator. So there's a bunch of places compression can go. Or, what if I put compression in this cylinder and it's going out another cylinder? Blow it in between the cylinders. Blow it in between the cylinders. But uh, we had actually one that was a, uh, that, uh, this Mercury Sable that was skipping, that was on, uh, it was a 3-liter three, three liter, three liter V6, and the fire in order is 1425-36. And so what we did on that one was, we got it on top dead center on number one because it was missing on number one. I mean, it had no compression on number one. So we got it where we knew it was on TDC number one, and we you know with both valves were supposed to be closed, and we shot smoke into number one, and it came out number three. Number three is not right next to number one on the forward. So what does that mean? If we shoot smoke in number one and it comes out number three, we still know where the problem is. So you've got a cracked head or block. Or a valve that's not sealed. Yeah, it's a valve, bent valve, whatever. It's open for some reason. You've got carbon under it holding it open. Something like that. What that means, if you if you do a three-liter V6 cylinder, and you got carbon under it holding it open, something like that. What that means, if you if you do a, a follow through the firing order on that 136 Where's cylinder number three when cylinder number one is at TDC compression? What was the firing 1425-36. Three is coming up on the exhaust stroke. So that means you've got an exhaust valve. It's either hung open, not closing for one reason or another, whatever. But you see, you can kind of figure it out if you think about it. All right, so what we did was we went ahead and put smoke into the intake, and we, you know, we put the smoke into the intake right here and pointed to a compromised intake valve because with the valve supposed to be closed, we capped off the intake and we were getting smoke out of our, the same hose that we were using to do our cylinder leakage test was producing smoke. So we have an intake valve that was compromised on that one. Well, uh, it gets better. So what we did was we got a uh, engine coming from LKQ, and uh, it was pretty cool. Incidentally, if you want to know the part number for this thing, this, that little kit that I got there, that's IPA Tools Calibration and Setup Kit 7891. So if you go to uh, IPA Tools website, you can buy one of those calibration kits. Of course, you can build some stuff like that too, just got to be careful with it. Um, so anyway, yeah, what I was getting at with the IPA thing, you got to be able to find top dead center on just any cylinder on the vehicle and you need to know how to do that because they're not all marked. You got to be able to find TDC with that. So we actually did this uh, motor. We got a motor coming and all that. And in the meantime, we wound up getting the uh, this Chrysler 300 that we had to do, you know, a uh, water pump on it and all that kind of thing. And so there was, uh, and these other guys were doing some more work on there. I just this was basically going the stuff that's going on in the shop. And then we had this. Uh, this is sort of going back to air conditioner. And I, I mentioned this the other day. We had a delayed reaction blower motor. When this lady turned on her uh, air conditioner uh, for five minutes, her blower would not work. And then it started working. Remember what I told you was wrong with that the other day? It was an Altima. It was like a 07 Altima. When she turned on the air conditioner for five minutes, she had no blower. 
None whatsoever. Was it a blower was this year? No. I mean, she had a perfect blower after that. But for five minutes, she had no blower. This was the this relay? Was, uh, it was this little potted relay right here. This is the exact relay that came out of the car. But what we did was we moved the rear window defrost relay into that position, and we didn't have that trouble anymore. Now, that relay cost about $35 because it's one of them funky little potted relays. Uh, but anyway, uh, there was this guy that wanted us to replace his cooling fan motor on a Mustang, and it was stinking up a storm. Uh, but the reason that it burned up the fan motor was because the fan motor shroud was warped and the fan motor was hitting the shroud and it had, you know, stalled the motor and then it kept trying to run the motor and it burned it up and all that. And so, anyway, the cooling fan motor was, uh, had to be replaced. The whole shooting match had to be done. Anyway, uh, Willie put this uh, motor in this F-150 that we came from LKQ and uh, let me look at, go to the next picture here. There it was. There they were putting the motor in. Now you might notice what we did there was we pulled the intake off and we bolted this plate across there and we put the hook on that, you know, instead of trying to bolt it to the intake or something like that. In a lot of cases it's better just to take the intake manifold off and bolt something right, you know, bolt right to both of the heads at the same time. You got to bolt it in there good and solid with something that won't rip out of the threads and all that kind of stuff. A lot of the times, uh, and at the shop where you work, they young guys will pull the body off the frame to do that. You know, in this particular one, we just dropped it in from the top. I was pulling the body off the frame is not that high. If you've done it, it's not hard if you've done it a few times. You put a lift under the body and you unhook everything, you know, with your, and you just raise it up. It, don't take for about 30 minutes. it ain't that, it ain't hard to do, and it's not all that hard to put back on. But, uh, but this flywheel issue is what blindsided me. I wondered if I had received a Windsor engine instead of a Romeo. Now, the difference between a Windsor and a Romeo is slight. But there is a difference there. Like one of them's got 12 valve cover bolts and the other's got 10 valve cover bolts and typically the oil filter's in a different place. Uh, so if you look at the eighth digit on the serial number, as I remember, and this is kind of weird, uh, a Romeo is indicated by a W on the eighth digit and a Windsor is indicated by a six. <laughs> Which is screwed up and backwards, I thought, you know. But anyway, whenever I got the thing, I wound up, the motor we pulled out had six bolts. That's the one that you got over there. Six bolt flywheel. The motor that they sent us had eight. What the heck am I supposed to do with that? You know what I mean? They don't send the motor with a flywheel on it. When you buy an engine from LKQ, it doesn't come with a flywheel. And so I called them up. I said, what, what, what are you trying to push on me here? Is this a different motor or what? You know? And the guy said, believe it or not, both came. In other words, you could have either one. And they said, until you get that motor out of there and you see what you got, we don't know if you got six or eight bolts. There ain't no way to tell without pulling it out and looking at it. So anyway, we got another flywheel. And, you know, there's the, there's the two flywheels right there, the six bolt versus the eight bolt. So if you ever run into that on one of them, that vintage, it doesn't mean you got the wrong motor necessarily, right? All right. Meanwhile, the, the guy named Garrett was working here. He managed to bust off one of the water pump bolts whenever he was changing out this, you know, this water pump on this one here. You know, water pump timing belt job, kind of like Harley did the other day. And uh, he had a leaking water pump. And he got that changed out, but he broke a bolt off. But it turned out after he bolt, broke off, if the bolt's not bottomed out in the hole, you can usually just screw it right back out of there. And that's what he did. Uh, but one way or another, Willie got the motor put in. Start, went to try to start it up and it didn't have any compression on any cylinder. It's just all lousy. So I called LKQ back and I said, what's up with this? You know, what are we doing about this? They said, well, they had to get me in contact with their warranty guy and he had to check and see we actually checked compression on it and it was just really lousy and all that kind of stuff. And so he says, okay, we'll send you another motor. So he sent another motor and we'll change it out again. That's the brakes of the ball game when you're getting salvage yard stuff. Ain't the first time I've seen that here. Doesn't usually happen, but I have actually had them send engines that I rejected off the bat, and they sent me another engine before we ever put it in the car. I have seen us get it in the car and find a problem with it, had to pull it back out, put a second engine in it and all that. And typically LKQ will pay you for, you know, for labor if, it's, if it was something that happened on there. All right, so, okay, so that's the second replacement engine that they sent us. That's not a really good picture of it, but it, that's what it looked like whenever they set it in there. And he ran that one really well. In the meantime, there was a Cadillac that came in here with a headlamp that was two problems. You know how headlamps get moisture in them? 
You seen that? Well, this one here had high intensity discharge module in it, and it was an HID headlamp. And because of where Cadillac mounted that high intensity discharge module inside the headlamp, all the water went down and just wet it really good. It just really the high intensity discharge. <laughs> it's part of the light. And I think on this guy, car, that guy that was driving it, he was in the welding department. He had done some research and found out that all you have to do on them and them Cadillacs, if you don't want to fool with them high intensity discharge lights, they had it fixed where the same connectors plugged into the regular lights that they did the HID lights on that car. And he was just going to get regular headlights and do away with the high intensity discharge stuff. No big deal anyway, you know. But uh, that was pretty, pretty double sharp. All right, so we wound up with a PO128 code on a 2006 Mountaineer while all this was going on. The engine was running at normal temperature, but the ECT sensor was reading about 50 degrees cooler than the truth. You see what we got right here? The engine coolant temperature sensor was reading 147 degrees, but you could take the temperature gun and you could shoot it and you could see 205. That's how you smoke out an engine coolant temperature sensor. Now the Ranger we've been looking at is running too cold out here and it's had five thermostats put in it. That one, if you shoot it with a temperature gun on the radiator, it's about 150 degrees on the hot end of the radiator. Uh, you also, looking at your temperature gauge on the dash, which is a separate sender on this one, and it's bouncing on the bottom, and your scan tool is also telling you when it's idling it'll only go to about 140 degrees. So everything is pointing in the same direction. In this particular case, our temperature gun pointed that we were with this was a, a big fat lie, which was a PO128, and we put a replace the coolant sensor on that, took care of that problem. Uh, that wasn't really the big deal on that. All right, so this is the final little tweaks after we really got the motor put in the, in the F-150, and that had really been a grand adventure. That was a finished product and all that. Well, where I was going with all of this, is anytime you're trying to, and, and you know, you were, you got me started thinking yesterday, uh, one of the things that everybody has got to learn how to do is find out what it is that's wrong in as much as they can before they ever start putting parts on. That makes sense. I mean, so, so it was really intelligent to be able to figure out what's wrong. So basically, you also have to understand how something works. You got to understand where all the bits and pieces are, and you got to be able to determine what the data is. Now, one of the things I used to get really ill about is in a situation like we were talking about on the uh, yesterday about that Buick, when the information that's published doesn't give you enough information to where you can render a decision without just finding your way through the forest by checking things. What really helps is if you've got another car that's running like it's supposed to, that you can check voltages on and look at readings and look at scan tool numbers. Something else you might want to do, uh, whenever you're talking about troubleshooting, is get used to what the scan tool numbers look like on a good car. If you look at a lot of good cars, scan tool readings, oh, that's, this is important for you. Every time you get a chance, if they're letting you do this kind of thing over there yet, plug in your Honda whatever and look at it on cars that are running like they're supposed to and look at those numbers and get used to them. And then when you plug in one where there's a problem and you say, wait a minute, I usually see so many, you know, 156 hertz here and this one's only showing me 34. Now, if you haven't looked at anything but the one with the problem, you won't know what you're looking at, will you? You get where I'm going? So gather all the good data you can. That's why I was telling you when we were in transmissions, if you put a transmission gauge on your car that's running like it's supposed to and you drive it for a week with a transmission pressure gauge on it, you're going to know what the transmission pressure is supposed to look like. And when it's out of that line, you'll be better off. Uh, the other part of it is, uh, what now what have you found on your engine skip, by the way? You know what that is yet? Not yet. <laughs> you want to fuel filter and I'll see if with it, with it, You got a fuel filter off yet? It plugged in? You might have to spray some stuff up in there where that tool goes and blow it out with air so that it'll release those fingers. If anybody bends those fuel filter fingers, you know, you have to... I've actually had to, on some of these, you know, they have these little short nipples on some of the fuel filters and then the longer ones on the ones that use the tool. Have you ever seen anybody take the little short fuel filter and snap it on there? I had to do that the other day. I had to make the tool to get in there. Yeah. Uh, I've actually had to take where somebody put the fuel filter on there that would fit the things were so short that the lines were right up against the filter. You couldn't get a tool in there. I've had to saw them off with a hacksaw. Well, I, mm -hmm. Mine, you couldn't get the tool by there. I had to grind it down way yeah. thin so you could fit it back there and pop yeah. it up. That's an engineering thing. 
but anyway, if you've got a bunch of dirt and grit up in that fuel filter, make sure you don't shove, shove your tool up in there and bend them little fingers. You can get the replacement retainer from the dealer usually. Long and short of it, you're going to get your uh, act together on troubleshooting. So gather every piece of data that you possibly can and see if all those pieces of data point in the right direction. Another thing, when we're talking about diagnostic decisions, and this is what this is pretty much about, if I've got a test that I can't trust every time, unless I can back it up with another test, I'm not going to trust that test. Like, for example, uh, whenever we used to use the old VAT40 charging system analyzer, if you hooked that thing up and you were checking the charging system and you flipped it over there to see if, uh, you know, to check the stator, you could not fool that VAT40. If that stator was bad, it would go over there in the red and you knew you had a bad stator. That was a go-no-go -go test. We got a, the, the VAT40 died, which made us all cry because we love that machine. And we put a, uh, another machine in there that was $1,700 that we got from uh, the uh, Mac Toolman. And it had a light on it that was supposed to come on if you had a bad stator, which that, that's your, your ripple would be bad if you were looking at it with a scope, you know. And so this thing would actually lie to you if the battery was a little weak, that little red light would come on and tell you you had a bad stator, but you could not take that to the bank. Now, the one that you had over there, I bet if we took the voltage regulator off, we'd find that brushes were worn out on it. That's, usually, that's what was wrong with yours. The brushes were gone. The brushes on an alternator wear out. You know, if you don't see that the windings in there are all burned up, you probably just got bad brushes. Of course, the bearing was in crappy shape too. Long and the short of it too, and I keep saying long and the short of it, I got to work against that because I'm hung up on it there. Uh, but what we got to do here, when I would put this machine on and it would tell me I had a bad stator, I would take a scope and hook it up and see what the pattern on the screen looked like. So if this machine, this machine, since I couldn't trust it, I had to have the scope, which always tells the truth, show me its pattern. And if I see a ragged, ugly pattern filling up the whole screen instead of nice little even bumps all the way across, I'd say, yep, we got a bad stator in that alternator. And so and there's a, another test, the fan test I was talking about yesterday, where you put your test light in there and you turn it through and if it goes off, the fan's bad, that's go no go. You don't need to test anything else. At that point, you know that fan is junk. So if you can trust the test every time to tell you the truth, you know, we had an injector cleaning machine one time that was supposed to tell us if injectors were, you know, flowing right. There was a little flow meter. You ever seen a flow meter? Got a little ball in there? Mm -hmm. You've seen the one on our smoke machine. Well, the, we'd have, we would hook it up so that the fuel that's going through this particular injector was actually supposed to the amount of fuel that was going through there was supposed to float this ball up in the gray range on a gray injector. If you, you know, that way you could tell if it had enough that we, you know, enough flow. And so I was cleaning a lot of injectors in those days with that machine, and I, start, I would check them. You know, they actually had it where you'd hook up to each injector and just click it from one injector to the other, look at all the flow and all. And I found out very early on that that was not a good test. I don't care if that is a $2,000 machine. I would see it flow test okay, and then clean the injectors and the engine would run good, but it would flow test different and worse. You know what I mean? It would flow test like it was a problem after I cleaned the injectors in spite of the fact that cleaning the injectors fixed the car. And so I stopped using that. And then the shop foreman one day came over there and said, sent somebody over there with an injector and says, can you test this? And so I just powered it up and shot some fuel through it. And I said, yeah, it's, you know, it's got fuel going through it. And he put it back in there and then because of the fact that he assumed that the test that was an actually exhaustively good test for the injector, uh, he put it back in there and they decided to do a bunch more work on it, you know. And then they found out, they brought it over there to me and I cleaned the injectors and fixed it. And he was yelling at me because he says, I thought you used that machine to check the injector. I said, you can't trust it. Now I should have shared that information with him, but he and I got in a shout match about that. Like I said, this is not a good test, and I stopped using it, and I should have told him I stopped using it. But anyway, they had done a whole bunch of extra work. It was a used vehicle, as long as used a car department. And all that. It was really kind of embarrassing, but the long and the short of it was if we should have cleaned the injectors first. Last thing I'm going to say before we adjourn here is where do you start? You start with what's cheap and easy, right? If you got one that you think is overheating, you don't condemn the head gaskets before you've put a thermostat in it. You know what I mean? It's always, you know, don't put head gaskets on it and then to find out that you had a bad thermostat. That's bad news, you know. Uh, if you've got an engine skip, don't put a $400 ignition switch on it when a set of spark plugs would have fixed it. Remember that? That's what we were talking about yesterday. Mm -hmm.
Somebody put a four hundred dollar ignition switch on that car, and all it needed was on that uh, vehicle, all it needed was a set of spark plugs. And so, don't start with what's expensive because it's easier to change. Start with what's cheap. You also got to decide. You know, a lot of times people will say, well, it's easier for me to just throw a computer on it than it is to track all this other stuff and hope it gets it. Well, now you spent $1,000. Uh, when Adam was working over at the, uh, another dealership, not the one you're working at, but a different one in Enterprise, this guy says, this thing needs a transmission computer, and it was $1,400. And Adam says, you're supposed to do more troubleshooting than that before you just throw a computer at it. Are you sure that everything else is okay? And the guy said, I don't want to hear any of your crap. You know, and, I'm just, and so he gets a $1,400 computer and the problem is still there. He digs a little deeper and rats have chewed the wire harness. So, you know, like so and, uh, who, pays the com who pays for the dadgum computer, you know what I'm saying? Last Saturday, you know, that, that Dodge, Dodge came in and they were saying that they needed a new ignition switch. And I was like, well, okay, it seems like that. And then, uh, so can I just take a few minutes before you guys buy a new ignition switch? And it belonged to one of the ladies at work. And uh, they're like, well, okay, whatever. And then I just found out it was just two bone fuses. And then I, I actually found out why they actually blew. That's smart. Um, it, it was actually, they used to go mudding a lot. And the, you know the top of the little fuse, this is the one with the little glass or a little plastic see-through thing? Mm -hmm. Well, those are completely missing. Mm -hmm. They said, and I asked her what happened. It was like, her husband actually pop them off at one point to look at them. Yeah, you couldn't see through, through the glass. Because yeah. yeah. it was like, you used it as a mud truck, I guess. And uh, the way he took it off. And I guess that actually, the wind eventually corroded away on the connection and that's why it popped both of the fuses. Yeah. And then I explained to everybody exactly how I came about doing it. And, well, I don't know. They didn't say nothing. They were just like, well, I guess we're not working on a mission switch. I guess you're not getting your hours, either. Yeah. <laughs>